Welcome everybody. I'm Diana Graber with CyberCivics um, and joining me here today is Peter who's also with CyberCivics. So today we're going to talk about CyberCivics levels two and three. Um, these are super fun to teach and I hope that you'll see that as we go through the presentation. All right, so as you know, I'm with CyberCivics, which is our digital literacy um, program. Uh, we also have a site for parents called CyberWise. Our motto is no grown up left behind. Um, it's a full of free resources and information for parents. And then I'm also the author of Raising Humans in a Digital World, Helping Kids Build a Healthy Relationship with Technology. It basically talks about the same topics that we teach to children um, and it's available where books are sold now in Spanish in case you uh, need the book in Spanish. Okay, so um, in addition to running cyber civics, Peter and I both teach the program at Journey School where the program was founded. Gosh, I think now it's been 10 years ago. Um, hard to believe that. Today, cyber civics, as you know, is available to schools around the world online. Uh, we are now taught in 45 US states and internationally, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, yesterday, we covered level one, which is our introductory level. It's digital citizenship, which is the safe and responsible use of digital tools. Um, it's really just the start. My analogy is it's like baking a cake and putting no icing on it. So what we're going to talk about today is really critical skills and information that I believe kids need today. Um, okay, so we developed level two after doing level one. And the reason for that is we thought, gosh, we gave these kids these great foundational skills, but you know, there's so much more to that. They really need to learn how to use the internet as a research tool. And there was a lot of data coming out to support what we were thinking. Uh, the Pew Research Center at that time did a big report called How Do Teens Do Research in the Digital World? And they found that for most kids, they just Google and they don't know how to do anything beyond that. So a lot of articles ensued like this one, why Googling is not enough. So we really addressed this topic in level two, which you'll see in just a moment. Um, and we cover it pretty broadly. This is a, a quick overview of levels two and three. Level two is information literacy, and you'll see all the topics that we cover. We're gonna to try to talk about a lot of those today. And then level three that we'll talk about is media literacy for positive participation. So before we get into it, I wanna show you how cyber civics works because we got a lot of questions about that yesterday. Um, oh, sorry, that's my next slide. <laughs> First, I'll tell you about the curriculum. Um, it's developmentally appropriate, and we spend a lot of time developing it this way to really meet kids where they are. So we sequence lessons in a way that really makes sense to them and builds upon previous skills. And you'll see that as we go through the curriculum. Um, super important, the program is delivered to teachers online. So you get to look at the lessons online, download them, deliver them to the kids in person. Um, Ideally in the classroom, that's not happening so much right now. So what we've devised this year is still delivering it to the teacher online and making it super easy for you to deliver the lessons to st students in a couple of ways. You could do it like this, like we're doing via Zoom. Um, you could record your introduction and send that to the student or you could even send the PDF home to the parent and let them introduce the lesson. Every lesson has a hands-on component that the child does either independently or with peers. That's super easy to do today during COVID. We've uh, converted all of our forms into fillable um, PDFs that the child can do on the computer or you can email them. They can do that way. You can upload them to Google Classroom. Um, our lessons are proactive. We want to empower kids to use technology safely and wisely. It's not fear-based and it really has a big emphasis on ethics. As I said in Smart Brief, it's an intentional deep dive that teaches emotional intelligence as, as much as it does digital citizenship. Okay, so here's a little overview of how the program works. In this short video, we'll demonstrate how easy it is to sign up for and use CyberCivics. After your school enrolls and completes the new school form or the renewal form, these are both found on our website, we will send the contact person at your school a PDF that looks like this. These are your school's instructions. They explain how any teacher at your school who will be delivering CyberCivics can open a personal account and get access to all of the resources they will need. Let's walk you through the instructions found on this PDF. First off, click the proprietary link or links to sign up for the level or levels you will be teaching. Remember, there are three levels of CyberCivics. Next, click register. This will take you to a page where you complete the registration process. Simply fill out the form, pick a password you won't forget, and select sign up. This will take you to the curriculum overview. Here you can learn about the level you are about to teach, read the teacher resources, and if you want to use them, download the student pre-assessments. 
Next, you'll see that the lessons are delivered in units. Each unit has a theme and includes anywhere from three to six lessons. Every unit begins with a very short teacher guide about the topic, followed by the parent letter. The parent letter describes at-home activities that parent and child can do together that align with every lesson you are about to teach. Next, you'll see the actual lessons. You can simply read them and deliver the activities in your classroom, or, as we like to do, download each lesson plan right before you are about to teach it. Here's how to do this. Select the download icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and download the lesson PDF onto your own computer. Then print it. It should not take you more than 15 minutes to read the lesson and be able to deliver it with ease. As you move through the cyber civics curriculum, these orange circles will fill in so that every time you return to the page, you can quickly see where you left off and which lesson to teach next. Some units have quizzes that you can administer to your students. These also include a quiz key. And sometimes there are videos that go along with the lessons. You can screen these directly from the system or because they are all uploaded to YouTube, you can assign them as homework for parent and student to watch together. One more thing, we don't recommend downloading all the lessons at the beginning of the school year. That's because we are constantly updating them. So please make sure you have our most current resources. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you. All right, so that gives you a quick idea of how to actually use um, the curriculum. Um, and now I'm going to talk about level two, which is information literacy. And like level one, it's broken into different units. Every unit has between three to six lessons. The lessons are devised to be taught in 50 minute units or 50 minutes uh, in a classroom. So I will go through each of the units, but I'm going to start with the one that we start with in level two, and that's learning balance. And the reason we do that is because what we're hearing from parents and teachers is screen time is really a big issue with our kids today. So we address that right off the bat in level two. It's a really good time to do it because generally they're coming in off of summer vacation when screen time has gone off the charts. Um, we know right now that this is a really big issue with our kids because of lockdown. Um, it's where they're getting their homework. It's where they're interacting with their peers. So screen time has really, really increased. So I think these lessons will be super important to do this year. So the way we did it in the classroom is we have kids keep these big books, their lesson books for cyber civics. And uh, the first part of this lesson is they have to track everything they do on a typical day from the minute they wake up in the morning to the moment they go to bed at night. Then they convert that data into chart. A little bit of math here. They have to make an activity chart. So they actually visually see, holy cow, I spent that much time on a computer. I had no idea. And then we break the kids up into their groups. We usually work in four person groups and that group puts together all of their data. This, this particular group spent 49 hours on a typical day using digital media. So that al always seems to be a little shocking to the students. Um, as I'm, okay, and then we put all the, the data on the board so the whole class can see how much time they spent using digital media on a typical summer's day. This was a class of like 24 kids, it was 186 hours. So that kind of blew everybody away. So seeing those numbers sometimes is a conversation starter. Um, that's gonna be a little different this year when we do it um, via distance learning. The way that I'm gonna do it is deliver it to my students, you know, the opening introduction to this lesson via Zoom and then let them have access to these fillable forms that we have this year. These are all gonna be available within the curriculum. Um, so the, the child can actually fill it out on the computer. You can upload it to Google Classroom or email it home, or they can, if they have a printer in their home, they can print it out and do it that way. But basically they, they do their time tracker. They still have to do the math themselves though. We did not put anything in there to add up the numbers for them. Um, and then they'll do the same thing. They'll organize their data with the, with the form on the left, and then they can make a bar chart with the form on the right. Um, Another part of this lesson too is we ask the kids uh, to make a list that we call it their bucket list of, you know, 50 things you would do if you could not have access to screens. And they have a lot of fun with this and imagine things they would do if they never had a screen in their life. And the reason we do that is because of the homework that goes with this lesson. Um, we challenge kids to go 24 hours without any screens in their life and to write us a little paragraph about the experience. And, you know, for us, that doesn't really sound like that big of a deal, but this is a generation who honestly does not know 24 hours without a screen. So this homework is really, really hard for them because their life is surrounded with screens. Um, we get a lot of paragraphs back like this. This is actually a boy who really fought me on doing this homework assignment. He told me what I was doing, asking them to do was illegal. And then he turned around and gave me this little paragraph. 
Um, last Saturday, I went 24 hours without media. It was difficult because my life revolves so much around media. Instead, I had to do other things like play with my dogs, walk at the park, or even go for bike rides with my family. The best thing about doing this is after a while, you start to feel calm and relaxed. I believe all people should go 24 hours without media. So that was really what I was hearing from these students. And I really realized that this was a gift to give them this little breather so that they could step back and analyze how they're spending their time, not only online, offline, but together. Um, within cyber civics, we have these send home parent letters that have activities that families can do that, that really reinforce what we're teaching to the kids for these lessons. So as you can guess, the, the activity that goes with this one is to ask parents to try to go 24 hours without media and then to discuss the experience with your child. Um, we have really bad results having parents do this, by the way. And then I hear about that from the kids. So this is a little excerpt that I got from one of my students. First of all, my parents are weak. They couldn't even separate for their devices for half an hour, which made it really hard for me. So I thought that was cute. Anyway, so that's our introductory unit. Um, the next unit's online safety. Super important before kids dive in and start using the computer as an internet source, a research source, because there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, I don't know if you saw in the news, but Twitter had a big hack just yesterday. So we teach them what all these terms mean. And then we do an activity, which is pretty typical for cyber civics. We teach them a concept and then we give them something to make it fun. Uh, this one, the kids have red, yellow, and green stoplights. And we read them typical scenarios that happen in regards to safety issues. This is one about a girl who is trying to figure out if she should use public Wi-Fi to go shopping in a Starbucks. It's like, no, no. Um, and so the kids hold up the color that they think is appropriate to the story. And that's really fun because then we can actually discuss it and as a group come to a consensus on what the right color is. Um, we don't leave you in the lurch, however. With all of our lessons like this, there's a guide for the teacher that describes what the terms mean and then tell you kind of your talking points when you just have these discussions with your children. For example, for this one, we say, you know what light should we choose red explain that it's wise to be extra careful whenever you go online using a network you don't know or trust on and on so it gives you something to say back to the kids um all right so then we start getting into really the nitty-gritty of level two which is searching the web um we found that kids really don't understand how search works works so that's where we start for example what is the world wide web this kid drew me a wonderful picture the world wide web is actually computers linked all together around the world physical computers um hey this is scott oh, from google we're here way. in times square new york to find out what is a browser a website that you can search on i think i call it the search engine that's what i call it the browser what is a browser and browse is a search engine. It's a search engine. Browse. What? So I played that with you just to illustrate that even adults don't know the difference between things as simple as a search engine and a browser. So that's where we teach the kids this vernacular. What do these things mean? What do each of them do? And then they have to draw analogies. So for example, one kid said, well, a browser is like the windshield of a car. And a search engine is like the steering wheel. So I think of that all the time now when I get confused between those terms. So it's a really great way to do that kind of have a memory device. Um, and I was going to show you this. The drawing isn't that great. This is one of Peter's students. But I think the way he described a URL is so powerful. He says it's like the train. So the protocol is the engine. And then there's the World Wide Web. And then there's the domain name. And then it tells you what kind of website it is. And then he says a URL is like a train. Uh, it takes you to your website destination in less than a second. So that kid will always remember now what a URL is and what all the components of the URL mean. Um, all right, so another thing that we really work on is what is a keyword? Keywords are essential in writing a good search query to find the information you need on the internet. So again, we tell the kids that and then we play a little game. This would be really easy to do at home as well. But basically you take like a common household object and you have the child try to describe what the object is without using any words in the object. So for example, on the right, if you wanted to get to the word beret, Brett, you couldn't say that word, but you say it's a metal class hold strands head. And then hopefully the person that you're saying that to would guess the answer. So when we do it in this, the classroom, one child will describe it using keywords and the class will represent Google and try to come up with the answer. So again, this would be super simple to do at home or via Zoom with a group of kids. Um, and then finally, really important in this lesson, we broke this down. And these are, again, a PDF that you can share with your students. But um, search 
result pages are very difficult to read these days. There are a lot of elements on there that really don't have anything to do with research at all. And so we show that to the kids. Uh, this is an example of one of our pages, you know, how to find an ad on a search results page. If you look at this page, your actual results aren't even on the beginning of the page. The first thing that comes up is Wikipedia, which is pretty, uh, pretty typical. And beneath that, you're going to start getting maybe the research that will help you. And so we point that out to the students. All right, the next unit, uh, really important right now, is your personal information and getting kids to understand that this is our currency when we go online. That's what we pay for all the free stuff that we get. Everybody wants our personal information. And we start to get students to understand that, so maybe they're a little more careful with it. Um, if you saw yesterday's webinar, you realize that we're building upon previous skills here. Um, we want to start addressing this whole idea of filter bubbles in this unit. So. Uh, a really fun lesson that we start with is actually one that I learned about through Common Sense years ago, and I think they actually retired this lesson. I'm not positive about that, but we sort of adapted it because it works so well. So basically what I do on the day of this lesson is I come into the classroom and tell the kids, guess what? No cyber civics today because the principal wants me to tell you that we're going to have researchers coming to the campus and they're going to be following you around and writing down everything you do and, and keeping track of everywhere you go, and they're collecting this data in order to make the school better and to customize it better for you. And so as I'm telling the students this, they get so angry because what seventh grader wants to be followed around all day, right? So I said, if you're upset about this, write a letter to the administrator. So I collect a bunch of letters like this. I'll just read you the top part. Don't you think that having someone follow children around without their permission is an invasion of personal privacy? The thought is in the right place, but it's a little creepy. Not a little creepy, a lot creepy. So they go on and on. But as the kids read me their letters, I write on the board, um, you know, invasion of personal privacy. It's creepy. Privacy is important. All these things that they all say. And then when they've, you know, they've vented, I tell them, hey, you know, this isn't going to really happen on campus. But guess what? Every time you go online, you fill out a form, you join a new app. This is what's happening with your data on the internet. And they're like, holy cow, I never thought of it that way. So it's, it's a good way to really open up this whole topic of personal information. And it, it works well with the next lesson where the kids actually have to read privacy policies. Um, we just updated this lesson and this year we're gonna have them read the privacy policy of TikTok because every kid today knows what TikTok is. And they have had a lot of privacy violations in the last couple of years. So, you know, if I told the kid that, they would care less. But if they read it for themselves, it kind of opens their eyes. So they actually read that privacy policy, and then they have to answer a bunch of questions. For example, this one, this kid answered, well, TikTok gets your information and sells it to third parties, which now they know what third parties are because it's part of the lesson. Um, they can also make your content into advertisements, which kids don't like. Um, and they also discovered that you have to get parents permission to use a site if you are under 18, which no kid ever knew because whoever reads the privacy policy. So really powerful to get kids to do this for themselves. And I'll show you what I mean. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the in, the, in the curriculum, the students read the privacy policy of Snapchat. And the next day we happened to get a visit from the Today Show and I'll let you see what the kids said. With Facebook facing fresh backlash for sharing people's personal information without their consent, these kids in California are reading the fine print. We've been learning about like privacy policies and terms of agreement. That freaked you out? Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's like, you guys have friends in seventh grade, obviously, outside of the yeah, school and outside your class. Yeah. Do any of them read the terms of agreement on social media? No. But, I know. Yeah. but they admit they feel the pull. Who texts? Oh. oh. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody texts. Ooh, FaceTimes. FaceTime. Oh, yeah, definitely. And in this class, their devices aren't a distraction. They're their homework. What is this homework assignment? It's a digital diet. Wait a minute, you guys made charts? Yeah. Olivia did a lot of sleeping, 12 hours. Yeah. That's good. How many hours a day were you So, using? um, I'm going to move on, but that whole clip is on our website if you want to watch it. The kids were adorable, so it was a really good way to see what they're learning in the classroom. But the point there is they were so excited about what they learned about their privacy policies. And after that lesson, uh, of those kids at the table, all but one deleted Snapchat from their phone and they told him, which I thought was pretty cool. So the last lesson that we do in the privacy unit is about passwords because passwords are, are our first line of defense um, when we wanna protect our personal information online. So we teach them the seven rules of making a great password. This year when I taught this lesson, the students were so cute because they're like, Mrs. Graber, can I take my 
grab my phone and take a picture of those because my mom doesn't follow any of those rules. So all the kids jumped up and took a screenshot or a picture that they sent home to their parents so they could follow those rules. So again, like all of our lessons, we teach them something and then we do something so that it goes deep. For this lesson, each child gets the name of a, a famous person who is a mnemonic and that mnemonic is their memory device for them to make a memorable password. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So these were a couple passwords that the kids came up with. Um, I'm gonna see if anyone's awake out there. Can anyone try to guess who the mnemonic is for either the first password or the second password? These are the really, really easy ones. And the way we do this in the classroom is the kids write their password on the board. First, we check for the seven rules and then everyone tries to guess who the memory, who their mnemonic is. Very good, Romeo. Yep, the first one is actually a Blinken believe it or not, president, 16th president of the US. And the second one is Shakespeare. But you can see where we're going here. It's, it's a really fun way for kids to understand how to remember to use the seven rules. Okay, so the next unit is copyright, which sounds incredibly boring, right? So every year we do a survey of our own students to find out of the three years of cyber civics, which were their favorite lessons. And weirdly, it's always copyright. And I think it's because there's a super creative component to this and kids love creativity. They love, if you know why TikTok and all that stuff is so popular right now, kids love to make videos and sing and perform and put that on the internet. So they get to do that in this unit as you'll see. Um, but really the essential thing that we try to get across here is when you write something down or or post on the internet and you've made it, it is protected by this law. And it's been like that for a long time. Copyright is a very powerful law that automatically protects you. So the way that we start this unit is we want the kids to make something so they'll understand how this works. So years ago, um, I had them sing the happy birthday song because happy birthday was protected by copyright. So I wanted them to have their own song. I'll show you just a quick clip of that. Okay, so it goes on, but this is, the, every kid did it differently, so it was really cute and they were really proud of it. This year, our kids were home on quarantine, so they couldn't do it in these groups, and I was really concerned that they would not resonate with this lesson at all. So what I did, instead of writing a happy birthday song, I asked them to sit, think about COVID, you're supposed to wash your hands, the length of a happy birthday song, so make up your own creative song to do that. And they shocked me with what they sent. I'm gonna show you a quick clip of this one girl. It was adorable. I won't play the whole thing. I used to get sick like all the time. I went to my doctor and she recommended a treatment called washing your hands. I was so amazed with these results. It makes me wanna sing. All right, I won't make you watch the whole thing, but you can see I got some really creative stuff out of these kids. And for the kids who aren't comfortable performing, they could write me a poem or a rap. But the point is they had to have a creative work that they were really proud of in order to make these lessons really go deeply. Because the next part of this is we teach them about the Creative Commons, which if you don't know is the next step in copyright. Copyright's really restrictive. And so today people like to share their creations online. So there's a more liberal way to do that through Creative Commons. Um, there's all these licenses that we should all know about because they're all over the internet right now. So we teach kids what they mean. And then again, so it goes deeper, they have to create, they have to choose and create which Creative Commons license want, they want to use to protect their own creation. So that's what you see here on the right. Um, and then it goes on because there's some exceptions to copyright law that we should all know about, public domain and fair use, which is really important for teachers to know about because if we use stuff for schoolwork, that's protected under fair use. Um, so all of that's pretty easy for kids to understand, but the part that's a little bit confusing is what is a transformative piece of art that's protected under fair use? So we wanna show them by letting them make a transformative piece of art. And so for this lesson, they actually have to draw something really beautiful and they bring it to class, they're all proud of it. And then I tell them they have to cut it into 25 pieces, which they freak out about. And then we take all those pieces and mix them up and then they have to make it into a new piece of art. So that's a, a, a hands-on way of demonstrating what transformative means in terms of creative works on the internet. 
And then the final unit in level one is Wikipedia. As you saw in our searching the web unit, Wikipedia always pops up as one of the first results on a search results page. And I know still a lot of teachers are hesitant about letting kids use Wikipedia as a research source, but we let we show them how to do that in this unit. Um, so we actually have them break down a Wikipedia page for all its elements and help them choose the parts that are really good for their research, which usually exists at the bottom of the page. And also we teach them why Wikipedia is so powerful, how this whole idea of collaborative intelligence is really what the internet is born in. Like together we know more as a big group than we, we know individually. So we take that concept into the final that we give the kids, which is really fun. It's a collaborative final. And so we cover all the topics that they did during the school year. Um, and they do it together and help each other and they get points not only for what they know, but for what, what each of them knows. And um, this can be done online as well. We, again, we've made all of the, these Google fillable forms and we're gonna help you throughout the year know how to deliver these to kids in the case of distance learning. So I did that really fast, but that you get a sense now of level two is really our information literacy level, which really lays the foundation for the third and final level of cyber civic, which is media literacy for positive participation. I'll tell you, having taught this so many years now, this is where it all comes together because these kids already have such great foundational knowledge and now you can su have a super lot of fun with them and go really deep in the stuff that's so important today, which number one is knowing how to understand media misinformation. So again, we start taking a look at their screen time, but we do it a little differently this year. We want them to understand that they're part of a participatory culture and that that gives them incredible opportunities to make things and share things with others. Um, so we want them to assess their media use in that way. Again, this will be a Google fillable form that will be available in the curriculum this year, but we want them to analyze how they spent their media during a typical day in terms of how much media did you just consume? Did you just sit there and watch YouTube videos all day or did you participate? Did you make something? Did you answer something? Did you write something? And then to make a little, um, this year, instead of a bar chart, it's a pie, pie chart. Um, so this kid spent 91% of his time consuming media, which is unfortunate. So we want to shift that. And at the end of the year, we give them this assignment again. This was the same kid who came back at the end of the year and was spending uh, 35 minutes consuming and most of the time producing. So we thought that was a good shift. Um, there's also a lesson in this first unit about we don't want to forget that it's important to participate with media, but also to realize how media has a way of capturing and holding our attention because of things that are built into it and what happens in our brains and all that stuff. So we teach kids about that in this level. So they learn about, you know, what's firing your brain and what mechanisms make you want to come back and all that. And so then they do a survey with their, their classmates and they add up all that, that information and they come back and really analyze it. So it gives them a very deep understanding of how technology um, holds on to our attention. And then another really fun lesson is um, teaching kids the art of blogging and really respectful commenting. Um, the reason we do this is because when we comment online, um, that often contributes to our digital reputation. Sometimes when you Google somebody, you see comments or responses they've made somewhere on the internet. And it's just nice to be able to know how to respectfully post comments or, or critiques of other people. So we practice those skills in class offline. The kids write a blog. We have post-its that represent our online comments. They pass it around the room and they all comment to the, each other's blogs. So again, it's a great way to practice online skills offline. Um, this is when we start getting into really the crux of level three. We, we do what's called crap detection. If you're not familiar with this, this comes from Howard Weingold at Stanford University, but basically it's a great acronym to remember how to analyze online information to find out if it is crap. <laughs> and you ask yourself, how current is it? Is it reliable? who's the author, and does it have a purpose or point of view? And they can use this again and again through the year. I use it when I go through Facebook and people are posting articles that I scratch my head at. I go through the crap test and often that's the way I can determine if something's true or false online. So um, we start really simply by giving kids websites to analyze. In the curriculum, we actually have printouts of the websites. They can do this, you know, if they don't have access to a computer, but um, they can actually go online and look at the websites and then fill out the form on whether it passes the crap test. So this website actually is a, is a real website, but it looks like a fake website. So that often tricks the kids. Um, all right, fake news. Great, great, uh, important topic this year. Uh, no shortage of information. We've just updated this, so there's a lot of the latest, greatest stuff in here. 
Uh, this is so important right now. Even the World Health Organization just said we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. Um, it gets me very angry because I, I read so much misinformation online and people need to know how to look at this information and figure out how to determine if it's true or false. So I'll show you the video we use in this unit because it'll show you what we, we're teaching the children. You've probably heard this term. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. But what exactly is fake news? And more importantly, why should you care about it? Let's start by looking at its history. Well, wait, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving. But it's, it's standing on legs. Those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. While fake news is nothing new, the internet has made it easier than ever for fake news to spread and even happen in the first place. Here's why. Before the internet, most people got their news from the paper, radio, or television. Because there were fewer sources providing news, it was in the best interest of each to be as reputable as possible. But with the internet, news moved online. Suddenly, anyone could post information on places like Facebook and Twitter. With so much information coming at us from all angles, it's easy to get duped. Especially when articles are made to look like verified news sources. People generally believe it to be true because it looks like news. This is happening more than ever. In fact, studies show that 75% of people who see fake news think it's real news. It can be really hard to tell when something is fake. Even our own eyes can be tricked. This is called a deep fake. Videos like this one use artificial intelligence to make it look like someone is saying or doing something they never actually did. Being duped by false information can have devastating effects on society and our democracy. That's why it's more important than ever for you to know what fake news is, be able to recognize it, and know how to stop it from spreading. So back to our original question, what is fake news? Fake news is when news, stories, or hoaxes are created to deliberately misinform or deceive. It also helps to know what fake news is not. News you don't like or simply don't agree with is not fake news. Stories that poke fun at real news, on parody sites for example, are not fake news. Opinion pieces on news sites are not fake news. And honest mistakes are not fake news. Still, recognizing fake news is hard. That's why it's up to you to be critical of what you see and hear online. A good way to do this is by using the crap test. Find out if the article is current. Sometimes old articles are recirculated online. Ask if the site where the article is posted is reputable. Open a second tab on your computer and look into the site that hosts the article. Find out who the author is. Is it a person with verifiable credentials? Find out the purpose or point of view of the article. Is it trying to sell you something or convince you of their position? Finally, you can always use plain old common sense. If you see something online that makes you scratch your head, then it's time to start doing some sleuthing. These sites can help. It can be easy to be tricked online, but if you're smart and ask questions, you can stop fake news in its tracks. Whatever you do, don't make, share, send, or like fake news. And watch out for clickbait. It's up to you to call foul on fake news. I just, I just saw a comment that someone says, I can imagine how my boys will react when we discuss the crap test. And I have to say something about that because when I teach this in the classroom, I write the word on the board and as the kids walk in, they're like, oh my goodness, what are we learning today? <laughs> and I had some sixth graders walk by the classroom last, or when I did this last, and they said, look what the eighth graders are learning. And so for two years, they're saying, I can't wait to be an eighth grade cyber civics to find out what they're teaching. So I do want to say for some teachers are uncomfortable with that acronym. So I got a great recommendation from a teacher last year that she turns it into CARP, D-A-R-P, because CARP are bottom feeders. And so that's a really great way to use the same acronym if you're uncomfortable with actually putting on the board, which I can totally understand that for some schools, it might not be appropriate. So there you go. Um, Again, in this unit, we have a lot of games that kids play. We play one where Simon says it's fake, where they have to analyze stories and determine if it's fake or true. And so we've pulled a lot of, um, this is an older story, but we've pulled a lot of current stories this year that have uh, 
up, up paired um, and we're going to play this game. And I have to give you an aside because I found something that was so blatantly fake. And, and again, when we do this for the teacher's guide, we give you like the background information to show you, you know, where it came from and to give you evidence that it is indeed either true or fake. And so I put something in the curriculum and lo and behold, two days ago on Facebook, a woman I know posted it. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so funny because that's directly out of the curriculum and it's so blatantly fake and people are believing it. So again, the stuff is being passed around today and it's so important to break this chain. And I think by doing these lessons, we can learn and also teach kids how to use these skills. Um, okay, we do a unit on uh, stereotypes and media representation. And again, this is one we've adapted this year um, to build in more le lessons on racial stereotypes because that's a big topic today and it's important for kids to understand that media plays a big role in perpetuating stereotypes and how to break that chain and to recognize it when you see it. Um, and then hand in hand is our unit on visual literacy. So much information that kids get today come vis comes visually there's a whole way to read visual media, the medium, even the way you take a picture tells a story. This is a great uh, uh, little lesson that they do to just describe this. The way you take a picture tells something completely different. For example, the, the boy on the left is the shortest boy in the class, but the way the picture was taken makes him look like the tallest. The boy on the right was the tallest kid in the class, but again, the way the picture was taken makes him look like the smallest. So they understand that the way you take the picture is important. And then there's Photoshop, right? So a lot of kids think Photoshop just appeared with Adobe, right? And pictures have been manipulated since there were pictures. So we do a whole series of these in the classroom. I project these on the board. They're also in the curriculum that you can print out. Um, but this was actually one of the earliest photo manipulations. If you look at this, it looks great. But this is actually the original picture. The person on the right was uh, photoshopped in. And so again, the way we do with, with the kids is we show them the original picture. They have to guess if it was photoshopped or whatever. And then we show them the original picture. In this case, one of the missiles misfired, but the news station did not want to have that embarrassment. So they, they doctored it and put the, put the thing and I'll show you again. Here it is. So that's our um, visual literacy unit. Uh, we also talk about today's Photoshop. Um, this came out of the news just literally a couple weeks ago. The image on the, the left appeared in a major news station and they made it seem like it was really happening in Seattle and it didn't happen at all. It was actually a, Getty's, a Getty image that they had doctored and put on their homepage of their website. So it happens all the time. And then of course, celebrities are Photoshopped quite often. We talk about that and we also talk about food. Food is Photoshopped. You know, a lot of times the food that we buy and see is not really what it looks like when we eat it. So that's a really fun unit. And then because we're talking about visual literacy, it's a really good time to talk about sexting. It, kids generally are in eighth grade for this unit. Um, so sexting is really an important topic, especially as they're going to go off into high school. Um, and just so you know why we cover it, um, super important data on sexting. It's very, very serious. Youth caught sexting could be charged under their state's, state's child pornography laws. This is so serious because um, a lot of those laws have not been updated to take into consideration kids sharing sensitive um, images about themselves. And, and sexting includes things that are sexually provocative as well. So it's important for kids to know that. And then a recent study found that 15% of teens send sex, 27% receive them. New data just came out this week on that, that I'm going to include in the curriculum, but those numbers have gone up. Um, but even so, that's one in four kids. And so most of our children will know someone involved in sexting. So it's important for them to relay how serious it is to get caught doing this. Um, and then uh, the final unit is digital leadership. We take a brief look at some of the emerging technologies. Um, and then we have kids talk about how they would use their ethical thinking skills in dealing with these technologies. We talk about AI, uh, deep learning, natural language processing. So that's a super fun unit as well. And then what we have in the final unit is sort of a, a recap of our information literacy unit. A lot of the schools we work with do an eighth grade project. Um, we encourage a research project at the end of this so kids can actually use the research skills that we've taught them. So we do a recap of that in this unit. It's an extra unit you're welcome to use at any time, um, but it takes them a little deeper into how filters and operators work in search engines, 
how to, how to avoid plagiarism, super important, how to cite online resources. So all of those skills, again, these are English language art skills that we should be teaching kids anyway. So if you're wondering where to put cyber civics, this, especially in level three, we're talking English language arts here. Why do we do this? This is my recap. Uh, we don't want kids to just be digital citizens. We want them to be digital leaders. We want them to use social media to raise awareness of things they care about. Uh, they, we want them to build an online network of people and organizations they admire, want to learn from. They, we want them to use their unique voices to inspire and to motivate. And the biggest thing of all, we don't want them to post things online that they're going to regret someday or that may close doors for them. Okay, so to learn more about cyber civics, please go to the website. Um, we have the curriculum fully aligned with the Common Core ELA standards this year, in addition to the ISTE's tech standards and the KSL social emotional learning standards. So we really cover all three of those areas and you're welcome to download that and take a look. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have our parent site called CyberWise, uh, No Grown Up Left Behind. Um, the, the website is full of information for you. We also send out a very, um, full uh, newsletter every two weeks directed at parents. So please let parents know about it. Uh, there's my book, Raising Humans in a Digital World. Um, if you do read the book, there's also a free discussion guide. It's, you can download it from our website as well. But um, what really works is when parents read like a chapter together or teachers read a chapter together and then discuss the topics in the chapter because all of this stuff is so different in whatever community you're in. We have to support the kids and really come to these common agreements. So hopefully the discussion guide can help you do that. Um, and then just this week, we started a Facebook group for teachers. Um, we thought it was a great way for you guys to share tips with each other on how to teach cyber civics and how you're doing it remotely and giving each other maybe share videos even of the introductory lessons. Um, so we're really gonna make that active this year and we're gonna contribute to it as well. And then uh, Arias, who does our social media, put this together, but we are very active in all the social media networks, always sharing tidbits of tips and information for parents and teachers. So if you're a social media user, please follow us. So I, I wanted to finish in 45 minutes, got two extra minutes there, but um, I want to leave this time for questions and answers. I know, Peter, thank you for doing that. I see you've been typing away there, answering questions as we go. But if anyone has any questions for me that I can address to the group, please put it in the chat box. Um, also, if you would like me to uh, unmute you, if you have a comment or something you'd like to say, just give me your name in the chat box and I'll unmute you. And you're welcome to participate. So I'll give you guys a few moments if there's anything that you want to ask. Or Peter, did I miss anything or any questions that I could address? We're up to date. Although somebody asked um, if somebody's using our curriculum in South Africa and Cape Town, that sounds familiar. Do you Ooh. know off the top of your head? God, I'd have to go look, but I can't think off the top of my head or not. Okay. We can let you know. Yeah, we'll have to look. <laughs> it's been hard to keep track lately, honestly. Uh, somebody says, will you email? Yes. So all these webinars are being taped or recorded. Um, we did a webinar a couple weeks ago for the Waldorf schools, and those are actually out already. If you don't have the link, um, just send either Peter and I an email, and we'll send it to you. And these are, we're going to send out um, next week in the newsletter. But if you want it ahead of time, just send us an email. We'll get you the link. What is the cost of the classes? Okay, so we don't, the reason we don't publish our costs, we talked about this yesterday, is it really depends on the number of students you have. We have a super low rate for, you know, if you're just going to do this at home with your kid, it's super cheap right now. In fact, we have a 50% off our already low price with COVID right now. So what does it bring it down to, Peter? For uh, 175 for the whole five for the all three levels if you're doing it with one child and then it goes up from there the most it could ever be if you have a humongous school is 699 per level um, but again we'll work with you depending on the amount of kids that you're reaching with the curriculum and um, when a school or organization subscribes to cyber civics anyone at that school can open an, i mean every any teacher at that school can open an account so you know if you have 50 teachers they can each have an account and then this year, because of distance learning, um, we are letting the, the schools use their license to get the lessons to their parents. So again, there's a couple ways to do that. Download the PDFs and the instructions, let the parents do it at home if you don't want to do it. Um, second way, the way Peter and I are going to do it this year, deliver the topic via Zoom, Google Meet, or even in a video to your students, and then send them the fillable Google Forms. We're going to upload ours to Google Classroom. 
and let them do the work at home. If there's group work, I'm going to use Zoom and I'm going to use the breakout rooms and let the students gather together in those rooms to discuss these topics. Um, I would really encourage you to do that because what we've discovered is our children are just dying for these opportunities to connect with their peers. And I would rather have them connect in a cyber civics class than in a TikTok video, honestly. So if you want tips on how to do that, please reach out to us. We're going to do a webinar in August to show the schools how to, how to make that work. Um, and someone said they missed the webinar for Waldorf. Send us an email and we'll send you the links. Um, if you're already a Waldorf teacher, you would have gotten it in your newsletter this week. And I do want to take Terry, um, Terry's question and I'll type in the, the others. Okay, let's see. What sets your curriculum apart from the similar ones? Okay, that's an easy one to answer. So um, I love Common Sense Media's curriculum. It's where I started, but they've changed it quite a bit. So the way they do it, they cover seven topics, but they only offer one lesson on each topic every year. And in my mind, that's not enough because kids forget. And so how we're different is we go really deep into each topic. And um, rather than, than, you know, one lesson in first grade, one lesson in second grade, we'll do like six lessons on it in seventh grade. So we go a lot deeper um, and we're, we're way more hands-on with our clients. I mean, when you sign up for cyber civics, it means you can have tutorials like this at any time of the year, you just let us know and either Peter or I or Eric get on the phone with you and do this. And we have the send home parent letters. Um, and then I think also we're, we're, what, what other ones are out there? So there's also the internet awesome, which Google, it's a curriculum that Google offers, which I think is awesome as well, but it's more directed at the younger kids. It's more for like the fifth or sixth grade. So we often recommend schools that want to do something before cyber civics to check into that curriculum. And then someone else asked, okay, the, the subscription cost is what I was talking about earlier is it's dependent on the amount of kids you're going to reach and our renewal rates really low. Even if you're the biggest school out there, your renewal rate is only 149 per level per year to sign up. And that gives your teachers ongoing access to the lessons. We update the curriculum fully every year. We give ongoing support throughout the year as well. Oh, and we send a newsletter out to our instructors monthly. Um, let's see. What's different with this and cyber? I don't know what cyber.org is. Do you know, Peter? No. Oh, that's not it. Yeah, I'm not familiar with them. I'm sorry. Um, it may, it used to be N-I-C-E-R-C. -E I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. I have to look it up. You win for me. <laughs> um, did I miss anything else, Peter? Any other questions? No, I've jotted down who wants follow-up info, so I'll be sure and get that to you all. Oh, do you talk about porn? Okay, that's a great question, and I've been asked that quite a bit. So we touch on it lightly in the sexting unit. There's a, a little extra uh, lesson in there that you can do with the kids that touches on porn, and we've really left it to, at the discretion of the teacher if they want to use that portion of the lesson. Um, some schools are very uncomfortable with it and have to get parental permission. But yes, there's a little portion in there that addresses that topic. All right, guys. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your interest in helping kids learn these important skills. We really appreciate it. And um, stay well out there. It's a crazy time. Stay well. Thank you all. And thank you and look, looking forward to hearing from you. Take care. Bye-bye. Good job, Diana.